You know, there are several gurus today, uh, religion guru, health gurus, management guru, guru, management guru, consultant guru, and then there are stigmatized gurus. So does it make you uncomfortable to be called a guru? Guru is a four-letter word, I understand that. <laughs> so it, it doesn't make you… So, no, no, I'm eight-letter, that's why I'm Sadhguru. But isn't the Western world better off compared to us today? How would I know in the See, realm of right now, life? Uh -huh. Right now, if I point a gun at you and strip you naked and take everything that you have, I will be better off than you. But how do I protect myself to put a gun on to you, strip you off and… So how do, how do I equip myself not to be at the receiving end? Namaskar Sadhguru. Namaskaram. <laughs> and welcome to Dialogue. Honored to have you with us today. Sadhguru, we live in a boundaryless world today. Everything that we do, we are either exposed to or influenced by what's happening in the global arena. And fortunately, we see that India is at the cusp of this transformation and slowly but steadily we are inching up in the global head table. I think you and me, I mean the industry that I represent, we have a significant role to play in this quest of supremacy. That's where I think we converge, our interests converge. You are a global spiritual guru, you are a global influencer. I represent the largest news network of the largest democracy in the, in the world. So we can reach out to the masses. And I think which is why I sought your time, which is why we are here today. I want to spend some time on the concept of spirituality. I mean, it is a way… It can, is, I, can I correct the question? Right, please. Is food a concept for you? Not really. What do you mean, not really? Food is not a concept. Food, I can see, it's an object, I can consume, I feel… No, no, you must consume, not that you can consume. I can see food. So no, it, no, it you must a... consume, otherwise you won't exist. I know. Yes. This but is I can see. Spirituality is just like that. But I can see that. That's your breath, the difference. Your breath, is it a concept? But I, but I can feel. Breath is feel. I, I know that oxygen is going in, getting converted and then going through the… You, can, you cannot see it, but you can feel it. Right, I might not Let us say it. spirituality is like that. You cannot see it, but you can strongly feel it, much more strongly than breath. That's why I call it a concept. No, when you say a concept, concepts are made in human minds. Spirituality is born out of human minds only. No, no, no. It no. is not a product of your mind. If you keep your mind aside, you will become spiritual. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So that's, that's where I was coming to. You know, it… Okay, if I say that, it is a… it is a way of evolution or enlightenment of mind and therefore betterment of life. Can I say that? Or otherwise, how do you… Can I, if I, if can I, I correct the question? Yes. Mind cannot be enlightened because mind is a society's garbage bin. Whatever is there in your family, in your neighborhood, on the internet is in your mind. What else can you have? Right. But you know that this is a garbage and this is not a garbage, it's the entire enlightenment. That's what I'm saying. You can no, have you, everything. If you crawl out of the garbage bin, you're enlightened. Yeah, but you still mind is there inside you. It it's a mixture there. of garbage See, and… You and must ghost. see, in your home, if you don't have a television, you can still live. Even if you don't have a phone, you can live. But you can't live without a garbage bin, otherwise your whole home will become a, like a garbage right. bin. Right, so right? is mine. So, but does it mean to say you will go and sleep in the trash can? No. No, Absolutely. that's all I'm saying. Absolutely. So, yes. if you crawled out of the garbage can, when you want, you can pick what you want. Right. Then it's uh, we fine. Would, we would like to make it a little more um, easy for… Uh, ordinary people like me to understand. I'm more ordinary than you. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> the whole world doesn't think so, neither do I. <laughs> so I'm saying that, you know, um, for me, you know, you define life as an assortment of certain time and energy. That's what I've heard you saying, that that's what life is. I would like a little bit of an understanding on that. But I would tell you the way I look at life. Uh, and I want you to either examine that or correct me. For me, life is, um, is an assortment of various interfaces that I manage. I will talk in the language that I can understand. Various interfaces that I manage, like you said that the family is the closest interface that I manage. Then comes maybe my friends, the other circle, colleagues, nation, environment, 
And I believe, how do I manage these interfaces? I'll have to create a win-win in all, each one of these interfaces. Because if I take more and give less, the interface would not be in equilibrium. For instance, we've taken more from the environment and given less. So it's now global warming, it's hitting us back. So I tried to, I, I remain conscious about each of these interfaces and I try to create a win-win situation. And how do I do this? I took out three levers, three ammunitions that I have. So first is that I try to remain too, true to my duty and myself. Who fixed this duty? I'll come to that. True to my, whatever my, I can comprehend, comprehend is my duty or I'm open to understand my duties from anyone. Sometimes society fixes it. Sometimes my organization fixes it. So I have certain duties or sometimes I fix it. The second is, I believe in living and letting live. And the third, consciously I don't do harm to anyone. With these three ammunitions, I try and manage the interfaces and that's how I live my life. That's what life is for me. So essentially, when you say interface, you're trying to define your transactions with the world around you. Correct. Let me do, because you said if possible, if it's necessary, you can correct. Absolutely. So let me lock you up in a really dark room where you can't see anything, can't hear anything. Are you still there? I'm there, but of course I'm still there. Are you there. there? I'm there. You're there. So you exist. Right. You think life is an existence or you think it's a transaction? I think life is a journey. It's a journey and... No, even if you're in a dark room, you exist, right? I exist. Yes. But I'm not... That's not the life see, I'm living. No, 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 no. If I'm... See, there are two aspects of life. This is life, which is alive right now. That's right. What I do also in English language, you call it life. But it's a transactional life. So the transactions of life can happen anyway, depending on the times in which we live and where we live. If uh, you were here a thousand years ago, you wouldn't be interviewing me. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Even if you were talking to me, they wouldn't be recording it. Right. All right? Right. So what we're doing right now our transaction is a consequence of the times in which we are. Absolutely. So le let's keep the transactions aside. Transactions of life are a consequence of various things, particularly times in which we it exist. It is a consequence, but if I stop transaction, do I still live? Can I have an example where I'm still living and there's no transaction happening? Oh, you'll live wonderfully well. Right? So I'm. let's differentiate between life as an existence and life as a transaction, which is first. Life is an existence yes. is first. So let's talk about that. Life as an existence, if I lock you up in a dark room where you cannot see anything, you cannot hear anything. I can breathe and if the food still, is there… Still you're very much there, right. you exist. Right. Only because you exist, transactions may happen, may not happen. Different people conduct their transactions and different scale and different modes and different fanciful ways. But transaction must happen. It may not happen. Uh, there is no such example? thing as it must. Existence must be there. Yes. Well, your existence is important. Absolutely. Transaction is a question of the times. How much transaction? So earlier we were talking about if it was another time, because you started the conversation like this, if it was another time, your transactions would be 10% of what it is today. Absolutely. But I still but have still to transact. But still you were fine. Your life was good. No, but without transaction, I just live like, as you said, the existence. But that's not the life you'd recommend anyone. No, it's not about what I recommend. We are looking at how life is made. See, my opinion, your opinion is not important. No, that's why I'm cross-validating The important thing it. is, no, no. Whether it's my opinion or your opinion, both opinions are not important. Today we've reached a world where I value your opinion, you value my opinion. This is a deal between two ignorant people. Right. <laughs> okay, you scratch my back, I scratch your back. Because if you question this, everything will collapse. So let's question that. If there is no transaction, if you simply sit here, you will be wonderfully alive. I must tell you this. If I… these days they're not giving me much chance, but if I close my doors, let's say I'm not available for four, five days, uh -huh. I don't read. I don't watch something, I don't look out of the window, simply just living. 
not talking, not listening, not doing something, not thinking. For four or five days, I don't even have a single thought in my mind. Suddenly, life will burst forth because in these transactions of the surface, you're missing the whole glory of life. Your existence is most important. Transactional means it's like this. Right now, to earn a living, or to make some wealth, or to form relationships, or to do something else, whole thing is going on. Have you ever been to somebody's funeral? Yes. You have. You see that man, the perfect man, or at least perfect posture, he's always like this. That's right. Nobody can maintain that posture like that guy. Right. He's like dead and like this. You go and tell him in his ears, you have just won a hundred crore lottery. The guy's not interested. You tell him, we have found the biggest Kohinoor in your backyard. Not interested? You tell him, the most beautiful woman in the world wants to marry you. The guy's not interested. Yesterday, he was jumping all over the place. What happened? He died. No, no, no. His life that, came to an end. That's a simple uh, explanation. That's not it. What has happened is, the only thing, the only thing that you have has been taken out, which is life. Rest is all your imagination. Hundred crores, Kohinoor diamond, man or woman, whatever nonsense is all in your imagination. Or in other words, essentially, you are misunderstanding your psychological reality as existential. If you don't separate these two, if you don't separate these two, you will be sleeping in the garbage bin. If you're out of it, garbage bin is very useful, most useful thing in your house actually. But if you sleep in it, life is not good. Yeah, right. There are sixteen parts to human mind. These sixteen parts, we will, for the sake of time, we will make it into four segments. First segment is called as buddhi. Buddhi is intellect. You want your intellect sharp or blunt? Sharp? Yes. Because if it's not sharp, it's no good. It's no good. But this sharp intellect needs the firepower of data. Without data, it's not sharp at anything, all right? Now, the next level of mind is referred to as ahankara. People normally understand the word ahankara as ego or something. No, Pride. it's the identity. Identity, okay. Your intellect functions only the way you're identified. Right. If you think I'm an Indian, your intellect tells you, you must die for this country. If you think I'm from the other side of the border, suddenly your intellect tells you, you must die for that country. So your intellect is entirely ruled by what you're identified with. Let's take the analogy of a sharp knife. Your right. intellect is like a knife. The hand which holds it determines what the knife does. Will it do a nice surgery and save your life? Or will it poke it and take your life? It is not determined by the knife. Nowhere it happened, a knife just jumped and stabbed somebody. It is only the hand which is holding it, which makes it. And suppose this is held by a, let's say, a little child. Because his hand is not steady, without any intent also, he hurts himself or hurts somebody, isn't it? Yes. So, you have a knife, you have a hand. But now your entire educational system and everything is focused only on sharpening the knife and providing it data. What kind of hand holds it? We have not looked at it. So the third dimension of the mind is called as manas. This manas is a huge silo of memory. Now, how much of this memory, if this body is memory and this hand holds a knife, how much of this memory, in what form it flows into this knife, is determined by what kind of hand this is, what kind of identity it is. If you make your identity, my family is my family values, this knife will wail for your family's well-being only. If you say my country, it'll do for the country. If you say for something else, it'll do... If you say my religion, it'll do for that. You have no choice about this. So these three aspects are in a certain way. One is a silo of memory, a hand which connects out and a knife which can slice things in the world, can make your life or break your life or make your life and break somebody else's life. All this human intellect can do, all right? Everything that you see 
in the form of technology, in the form of this and that and all the conveniences we are seeing are product of this intellect. But how we use the technology, whether for our well-being or not, is determined by our identity. Memory, you can't do anything, it's there. Everything that you come in touch with, memory is gathered. So one important thing about spiritual process to move in that direction is to take a cosmic identity that you don't identify with anything limited. Above all, to identify with our ignorance, not with our knowledge. Because how much ever we know, it's just a speck. But if I don't identify with any... Uh, if I don't have any identity, then what will guide me? Uh, I'm come, trying to come, come to that. See, what you know is a speck in this universe. Neither the religious people nor the men of science know where does this cosmos begin, where does it end. Before we move on to the next topic, I just want to know that do you have a very simple step-by-step, step, in my parlance it's called SOP, that standard operating process. Oh, of course process. I have a SOP <laughs> So if you could tell us about the spirituality, <laughs> your SOP. Somebody, somebody came here, this man has spent a certain amount of time with J. Krishnamurti and then with U. G. Krishnamurti, he spent time with Rajneesh, he spent time with Ma Anandamai and uh, some other Western teachers, everything. He came here and I didn't know he's here in the ashram, he spent some time. And uh, our programs are going on, he's watching two, three weeks programs. People come the way they come and the way they go out. He said, I've been to... He, I, he wanted to meet me, then I met him and I said... Uh, he said, I've been to all these places, each one of them has taught me something. But what I see is, you have created a spiritual factory <laughs> I thought this is a very apt description. Because whoever comes, when they go out, they'll go out in a different way. This is a spiritual factory. I like that. I, I was just joking with our people, I think we should call this Isha Spiritual Factory instead of calling Isha Yoga Center. So, no, 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 Sadhguru, they are scared of factory. <laughs> they think it's commercial. But factory means you have repeatedly, you can produce the same quality Absolutely. over and over again. Yep. Yes, that's what I am, SOP. All right, let me tell you. See, what is spiritual, first of all? There is physical. You can see it, touch it, feel it, you know, there is physical. The basis of physicality is boundary. If there is no defined boundary, you this cannot call it a physical thing. Absolutely. Yes? Right. Only because of a defined boundary, this is physical. physical. Everything physical in the universe is Has a defined a boundary. boundary. Right. Yes. So, if we touch something which doesn't have a defined boundary of any sort, for now, technically, we can call it spiritual. I still haven't understood that how I adopt okay. spirituality. I'll come to, I'll come to that. I, SOP. But, uh, any, so, I think it's all there, maybe uh, no, it is no, my inability. I, I'll give you the SOP. I'm telling you, I'm but running it's a, a simple. No, I'm, I'm running a spiritual factory. The mess essential question is, without values, how do I keep myself okay? That's right. Without doing all the wrong things in the world. Right. That's the thing, right? And how do I become spirit? Is spirituality, for instance, is spirituality religion? Yes or no? Which is not? Which I heard from many sources. But what is spirituality, and how does one practice it if that's to be practiced? Adopt it in his life if that is to be done. So, what is the SOP? We can give you a simple rubber with which you can slowly obliterate the boundaries of your experience. So, if you sit here... Okay, all right. If you sit here, if you can experience what is here, not just what is here, without something that you cannot see. So, is this mumbo-jumbo world? So, let's do this, right? Let's do an experiment with you. You do one thing. You Put your hands together like this, with eyes closed, you will... Uh, look at me for now. You will, you know, vigorously rub these hands for twenty seconds. Do that. Vigorously. You're looking. Twenty seconds, you said? Not here, twenty seconds. <laughs> <laughs> When you close your eyes, twenty seconds is a long time. I was counting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now keeping your eyes closed, just hold it three to four inches away. Yes. Something happening between your hands. Yes. Right? Yes. So why this is happening is, in some way the boundary of your body is loosened up. 
This isn't it static electricity no, being no, formed? No, no, we'll come to the static. Wait, <laughs> open your eyes now. Right. See, yeah. there is water in this, all right? There's water. Water in this vessel, is it you? No. No. But if you drink it, does it become you? No. What do you mean? No, it doesn't become me. It goes inside me. It doesn't Your become... body is seventy-two percent water right I now. I know that. That's not you? That's not that water which goes inside. Once it gets assimilated in That's my body... That's what I'm saying. Yes. If it, if gets it goes inside means I'm talking about right. assimilation when it only. gets assimilated, it is me. Yes, it wa it got inside the That's, body, yeah. not just the stomach, it went yeah, into it every cell in the body. body. That's right. So, <laughs> this water, if it's outside, it's not you. No. But if it's inside, it's you, mm. right? The same has happened to the food. That's how you got this body, otherwise you were born like this, you were not born like this. Right. So, you just accumulated something and you thought it's me. I'm asking you a simple question. What you accumulate can be yours, but can it be you? No, of course not. It can be mine, but it cannot be. Unless and until, it's a nature. It's something that I've... if you... if abstract form. In physical form, it cannot be my... me. But so in abstract form... this is not you, what I'm seeing here is not no, you. No, I'm saying in physical form, it doesn't become me, what I accumulate. But in abstract sense, I can assimilate in my body and I can make it me. I can become, let's say, I, I can become a murderer tomorrow, which, which is me. I, if I assimilate that kind of uh, mindset from no, outside... Listen to this question properly. Whatever you accumulate, right now this clothing... Yes. I can say this is mine. Right. But if I say this is me... No. You will think I'm a nutcase. <laughs> yes or no? Right. So this is happening to you every day. Food comes on your plate, you say this is mine you eat it and then you say, this is me. Mm -hmm. Is this a case? Yeah, but it undergoes many scientific... It doesn't matter process. what Eventually, process. okay, right. But this is also case. Right. So, when you get cured of this case, that's called spiritual process. You clearly know what is you and what is yours. You are not mixed up between the two. And there is a method to do that. This basic method, we call it inner engineering. If you're willing to dedicate, Thirty to thirty-two hours of your focus time, we will make it happen right. for you. Right, I'll give it a shot, certainly. So, is spirituality... Um, is it logic or creativity? We say that we're in, in, in our... <laughs> in our uh, creative domain, we say where logic ends, creativity begins. Uh, so, can it be formed in the dimension of either logical dimension or creative dimension? No. See, if you don't have a, a strong and stable fundamentals of logic, you can never explore this. Wonderful. At the same time, if you... you if your logic is like quicksands where you've gotten into it, then you will never explore it. Right. Stand on the stable platform of logic and reach out for the magic of life. Wonderful. Right now, if you eat a mango, you become Varun. Is it not magic? Whatever logical nonsense explanation you give, it's magical, isn't it? If you put filth, filth at the mango tree's root, it becomes sweet mango. Is this not magic? So if you experience the magic, we call it spiritual process. If you experience only the limited logic, that is material life. Right, that's very... that is comprehensive. And uh, we've got, we've got yeah. a method, a factory. If you put you through the factory, you will come out magical. <laughs> I would try... <laughs> I would like to try that one day. <laughs>
it will become instability over a period of time. People, this happens to a lot of people, at their young age, they're simply ha ha ha, hoo hoo hoo, giggling. Suddenly, one day go into depression. You've heard so many people like yeah, that. I, I also heard about a bipolar disease which happens yes. periodically. So this is because there is no stillness. There is exuberance, but there is no stillness. Balance. Exuberance is more mental and emotional. We are talking about life exuberance. Every cell in the body is exuberant. Now we can prove this. We have a you know, research center in the Harvard Medical School, where they are studying these things and showing how on the cellular level, a different level of exuberance, the genetic level, a different level of exuberance, the, you know, the, uh, the B BDNF factors are like 70% higher, cannabinoids are 70% higher, endocannabinoids are 70% higher. So you're exuberant on a cellular level. You're, en you're enthusiastic. Not because in your mind you're interested in something, simply you're on. This is important, if you're on like this, whatever is needed today you can do. If you're passionate, only one thing you can do. If somebody asks you to do something else, you cannot do. Mm -hmm. So, if I can do this, I cannot do that. One way, it's a way of crippling life, isn't it? So, exuberance is important. But if exuberance is not backed by absolute stillness within you, Exuberance will become, Disturbance. as you say, bipolar or whatever you want to call it, it'll get there. And intoxication, intoxication is very important. If you are not intoxicated, you can't go through this world uns unscathed. Yes, right now you understand intoxication only as alcohol or drug or something. The problem with that is, I have no moral issue with that, but the problem with that is it takes away your awareness. Mm -hmm. You're not conscious. So, to be absolutely intoxicated and be super alert, if this is possible, is fantastic. That's what this is. How is this possible? Now we can show you, there are studies, if you're interested, you can look it up. There are studies to show how the very chemistry itself, as I said, 70% increase with inner engineering program, 70% increase in the production of anandamide and endocannabinoids. So you're always stoned out. So nothing, nothing really takes a toll on you. Any kind of activity, any amount of activity doesn't take a toll on you. You're on, on, on. It doesn't take a toll on you. Everybody's, you know, I'm as a part of this safe soil thing, the Swiss tourism, you know, ministry supported us. So they asked me to do this. So I was doing some videos for them to promote certain places in Switzerland. So in, I was in near Lausanne where there's one lake and they wanted to promote that as a tourist destination. As I was doing this, this official asked me, Sadhguru, where do you take vacation? I said, what is that? <laughs> what is a vacation? I don't know what's a vacation because I'm on and on and on. And it doesn't take a toll because anyway, I'm fully stoned <laughs> all the time. This is the greatest chemical factory on the planet. There are several gurus today, uh, religion guru, health gurus, management guru, gurus, management gurus, consultant gurus. Consultant. There's no entry barrier to become a guru. And then there are stigmatized gurus. So does it make you uncomfortable to be called a guru? Uh, guru is a four-letter word, I understand that. <laughs> so it, it doesn't make you… So, no, no, I'm eight-letter, that's why I'm Sadhguru. You know. what, what, what does Sadhguru mean? Where did you… where did you come up with that? I mean, I didn't come you, up with that. So who gave you that In, in this culture, generally people are aware of this. See, if you go to a Sadhguru, you don't consult him about what the Vedas say. He hasn't read anything, <laughs> he's as ignorant as you. So, if you want to know scriptures, you don't go to him. If you want predictions of stars, you don't go to him. If you want something else, you don't go to him. If you want to know how this one works, you should go to him because that's all he knows. I don't know anything other than I know this piece of life from its origin to its ultimate. Fortunately, every other life is made the same way in its fundamental. That's right. So, I'm only talking about myself, but they're all thinking I'm just addressing their issue. Right. So, is there an origin of this uh, title? I mean, uh, it came up from some of your disciples? It's or? just generally started, people started calling me that way. It stuck. R right. It's so, a description, it's not a title. Let me make this clear. It's a description. It, yes. How do you define success? And is success important? Uh, success is the only thing that's there in life. 
So between happiness and success, which would you prioritize? Happiness is also success, isn't it? For me, if I tell you that, uh, again, I'm a very... No, no, I'm, I'm trying to say this to you. See... Happiness is... Success is a means to happiness, could be. No, no, no. Many other things will no, be no, means no. to happiness. No, I want, I'm looking at the word success in a much more... Uh, you know, I would like to know that... Your general way. Yeah. See, right now, if I blow my nose, if there is a bin out there, I would like to throw it so that it drops into it. Nobody is going to give me, uh, you know, a World Cup medal or something for dropping a rolled up <laughs> tissue. But, but if happy. it doesn't go into the bin, I will get up, go there, pick it up, again come and sit here and again throw it. Because every action that we perform, physical, mental, emotional, whatever kind of action we perform, Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The purpose of any action, it's whether it's that. physical, psychological, emotional or that. energetic, whatever we do, we want it to be successful. Then where is the question, is success important? Success is the only thing. And even if you get enlightened, that is, such, uh, that is a success. So for, for um, an ordinary person like me, I comprehend it this way. You're a very I, special guy, you keep on saying, I'm ordinary, I'm ordinary. Uh, no, I, I keep reminding me that way because, you know... That is because you is don't believe it. <laughs> no, I'll tell you. No, as I said, ordinary is extraordinary. So maybe somewhere in my mind, I believe that I'm extraordinary. <laughs> but that's besides the point. No, I'm saying that happiness, according to me, from what you have said, is a simple equation. That if the real outcome is equal to or better than what I expected, I would be happy. No. Isn't so. No, no, no. I'm just happy. No, that is blissful happiness, uh, exuberance of life, which is on the other side. But I'm saying in a day-to-day -day life... Uh, you want a... something to work. Right. So you have set out to get something, you have an expectation. As long as the real outcome is at least equal to your expectation, you'll be happy. Like, you'd have been happy if the, if the tissue had gone to the bin, which you are expecting to do. And if it falls below your expectation, you're not happy. No, that's, no, no, I'm very happy still. No, that's your blissful <laughs> thing. That is another thing. I'm saying for an ordinary person who has not attained that spirituality of No, no, of I'm yours. saying there are no ordinary people because everybody pretends to be ordinary when they have to contribute. No, no, no. They pretend to be ordinary when they have to contribute. You put them in a line to receive, they all become very special. Oh, <laughs> I am I, I, I'm more hopeful on the humanity. In the context of that Western world's belief, René Descartes said, I think, therefore, I am, which is what you echoed that, and they wanted to be enlightened. But no, overall... No no. no, no, I didn't echo that. No, you said that they tried that, they, where th they said that they wanted to think, and then they could not... Descartes said, I think, therefore, I am. Huh. I know. I'm asking you, are you, are you here, and then you think? I know. Yes. I, I'm saying okay. that, that you have okay. said that in the Western world, that is what Got it is. It. But isn't the Western world better off compared to us today, how would I know in the See, realm right of his now, life? Uh -huh. Right now, if I point a gun at you and strip you naked and take everything that you have, I will be better off than you. But how do I protect myself to put a gun on to you, strip you off and... So how do, how do I equip myself not to be at the receiving no, end? No, that has to be done. It's a historical situation. It is a fact that is well documented now that 250 years ago, everybody wanted to come to India. Right. Why? Because you think, of the natural You think way. they were in love with us? No, never. <laughs> they came for their, uh, their purpose, their, uh, the wealth that we no, have. No, because it was the largest economy on the planet. Largest economy and the wealthiest economy. Now, everybody wants to go to United States because it's the largest economy on the planet. So we... Okay. So you're saying by force it has been taken. Of course. By the, but our way is still right. And... See, what we did then, when nobody knew what is what it is to create a manufacturing nation. We were a manufacturing right. and trading Zinc, nation. Right, zinc, etc. Yeah, zinc we could only manufacture, I've read Not somewhere. just that. I'm saying that's one of the things the whole world didn't know. We knew the secret of manufacturing zinc. See, like that there could be many. When... When Krishna Teva Raya was there, Vijayanagar Empire, the swords made in Hampi and Vijayanagar region was sold across the world for the Greeks, for the Romans, for uh, Arabs, for everybody, we made the swords. That means our metallurgy was better when you go and fight in a war. Absolutely. It never broke. 
That's the important thing. But we bought horses from them because they had better horses than us. So I'm saying they were only selling what was naturally there. But we were manufacturing. But that manufacturing... Today everybody thinks India is an agricultural nation. This happened because manufacturing was systematically broken and people started scratching the earth to make a living. We are... We are not an agricultural nation. We had agriculture, but that was not the main thing. That was not our edge? No. As a republic, we are seventy-five years old now. Seventy-five years is not too much. But for the kind of history and cultural background that we have, I feel we should have become a developed nation within thirty-five years, not seventy-five years. That did not happen. For a variety of reasons, it's not... There's no point doing post-mortem and blaming this no, person, looking that forward, person. What there's no point. Do? But we made some serious mistakes. Serious mistakes means geographical mistakes when you make, you can't fix it. So that mistake has been choking us. For example, well, for whatever uh, tumultuous situations that happened, uh, we decided to make the country into two pieces or three pieces. If that's how it has to be, let it be. But for thousands of years, we've been a trading nation. We've been trading across the world. Just everybody in the known world for the last 10,000 years know that Indians bring all kinds of magical products. So how were we going? We were largely going by land. We just closed the trading routes on both sides, east and west. And then we have become an island nation now. We are an island. Economically, we are an island nation. For an island nation, from a grain of rice to anything has to only come by maritime means, which is a severe handicap for which we are suffering. Nobody points this out, but this is a fact. If... if we had even left a corridor, let's say you partition, it's all right. But for trading purposes, one hundred mile corridor if we had left, you would have railways, highways running into European capitals, Central Asian capitals, and Southeast Asian capitals, and you would have pipelines running and doing everything. Absolutely, that's what Brits did. It was perpetrated, it was mm, planned that way. I've... That's why the partition happened. See, what we they... We didn't did... do it. We no. were at the mercy of the Brits. No, 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 I wouldn't say and that. And some of us had succumbed to those pressures or, uh, uh, or... See, that's what I don't want to blame anybody, because it's a historical mistake, all okay. right? So, uh, when you say, why are so many people starving? I'm just telling you the reason, because geographically, a large nation like us with a huge population, we made ourselves into an island. The world that we live in today, isn't it completely different from the world where I was born or you were born? I don't see it that way. Every generation likes to think that they are a very special generation. Even if you look back a thousand years ago, I'm sure people who lived then thought that was the most important time. So we are saying the same things. Only in terms of reach, we are big now. Reach also defines possibilities. But people who operated just in their village, that was their world. In their experience, it's just the same as you communicating with somebody in Timbuktu. <laughs> All I can say is gossip has gone global. <laughs> so, but the experience of gossip is same. It might have... the scale has gone up. So when the scale goes up, our... our responsibility also should go up. People keep asking me, Sadhguru, what are the many problems in the world? I said, there are no many problems, there's only one problem, human being. If you fix this one guy, everything is fine. I'll just explain why I feel that the two worlds are different. Couple of points. You know, once uh, my son, when he was about eight or ten years old, he walked up to me one day and said that, Dad, when our generation will grow up, again the elders will know more than the youngers. Now that had been an eye-opener for me, because when I was, let's say, in my teens, I never knew under the sun more than my dad. Because the source of information was limited, mostly had been the newspaper. He would have read it inside out, I would have glanced it through. 
that one part i believe has changed because i don't think that i know even 1% of the world of a teenager and what's the interest what's the mindset usually the source of information for previous generations was your granny or that's grandpa right. that's right today also it's a google granny yeah but the google granny is more than the real granny i mean as you said that the scale makes a difference real granny would have been a minuscule but i'm saying in quality there's no difference it's just the scale and scale will only make a bigger footprint doesn't make a different footprint nor will it allow you to fly the other thing this young generation it's just coming out focus and commitment that i think has drastically reduced in the current generation i'll tell you why focus is always compromised when you have so much in front of you at the touch of a screen there is anywhere in the world so they are not focused on anything the other thing is a commitment commitment is important or commitment is an automatic choice possibly when you have lack of options so they have multiple options this focus and commitment i tend to see that has reduced just drastically in the current generation human attention is the only thing which opens up doors without attention you cannot open any door either of material world or spiritual world it needs attention the keenness of your attention de- determines the profoundness of your experience of anything every people those who look at everything on the surface they have no profound experience of anything but if you pay attention to anything substantially everything is super profound i know that you have tried bringing about changes within your realm but how do we go about changing the entire thing first of all you're trying to provide human beings to be fed into a certain machine Absolutely. which we call as the economic engine right if that economic engine has to run at the pace at which it is running and we are not happy it must be running every year 10% more speed for that you need to sacrifice your children your children are the f- fuel for it don't think your children are future which you what you said i don't believe that your children are the fuel to run the economic engine faster and faster and faster so without changing that without changing the aspirations of the world you cannot change the education is just talk you can in a niche way like here it's a niche 340 children i have limited captured there nothing more we have a lot of problems over 11000 applications but only 340 children hmm. because if we increase the size we will lose the quality we know that so niche things you can do here and there but for all the children on this planet can you provide this kind of education no 100% no because that many dedicated people are not possible and above all people are not interested in a child growing up to become a full fledged human being a beautiful human being a joyful human being a blissful human being they are not interested he is fuel for the economic engine and you think there's no way out from there there's nothing that can change people's mind i mean uh, that- one hope one big hope that i see is ai if all the work on the planet <laughs> all the work on the planet including the journalist work is done by the machine then we won't have anything to do right when we don't have anything to do then human beings individual human beings can do whatever they want whatever they want they don't know whatever they want because they are molded by somebody if not the family it's the google if not the google is a neighborhood back street somebody will mold them right unless parents have come to such a point either they have created enough wealth whichever means they have <laughs> or they have reached such level of maturity it doesn't matter if my child is not economically great if he is a great human being if he is wonderful within himself he is joyful he is well that's all that matters to me thank you very much sir for you. coming to tola it's Namaskar. been a wonderful experience and and uh, look forward so you must to take the seven step uh, i will path to blissfulness i will i desperately <laughs> need that <laughs>